Hello, everybody, and welcome to Peace Monarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network. You could also find me on theconsciousresistance.com and theseedsofliberty.com. So today we have James Chalemi coming from Florida. He's a voluntarist, libertarian, and he's a co-host and co-founder of uh, libertyhangout.org. Um, and you could also see him on the Liberty Hangout YouTube channel and Twitter by the same name. Uh, he's got a Facebook page, James R. Chalemi. Uh, at, uh, we'll <laughs> put the link to that in the uh, in the description. And he wrote a couple of articles. He wrote a bunch of articles. Um, some we might discuss. The, one of them, uh, there's no such thing as a necessary evil. And the other one, death of the petrodollar and uh, abolishing po- the police. Um, and he's actually in law school um, uh, on his way to becoming a lawyer, which... Uh, Sounds like a contradiction, I'm sure, <laughs> to most volunteers and anarchists, but uh, I assume he has good explanation for that, so we're going to get into that. And uh, and also, since he's interested in law, um, you know, what does, what does it, you know, how would a society look where law is not monopolized by the state? Because that's all that we ever know, right? Law that has been monopolized and, and the court system and the justice system in general. Um, and also, he, and also we, we, uh, we'll get into um, the pragmatic approach of how to move liberty forward, uh, the liberty movement, um, you know, what things we can do in our everyday lives to, uh, to bring about more freedom. So, uh, James, thanks a lot for coming on the show. Danilo, it's an honor. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, I, uh, I interviewed Justin uh, a couple of months ago, and uh, he's like, you got to get this guy, James. He's a smart guy. You're going to love talking to him. So, <laughs> so I'm like, sure. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'm gonna hope to uh, to definitely follow through on his uh, his promotion. <laughs> yeah, he's a cool he's a cool guy. Um, so yeah, so so before we get into the the law, I'm sure you have a lot to say about that. Can you just get into a little bit of your background, how you became a, a voluntarist, um, anarchist, libertarian? Of course. Um, well, I was what I would refer to myself as a Reagan Republican um, coming out of high school. I, I grew up in a very liberal state. Um, and I think what, what led me to conservatism as I thought of republicanism was the fact that it's such a liberal state and that to see the horrors of what goes on um, with big government, with a, a huge tax code, with a lot of laws, um, I think my, my conservatism was a pushback um, saying, well, you know, I like the ideas of limited government and I like, uh, I'm Team America and, you know, very strong support of the military and all these things. And that's how I kind of went into college. Um, as I was picking what major I wanted to study, um, it was right around the time of the 2012 election. And I was a huge Mitt Romney supporter. And basically, I was going to rallies for Mitt Romney. Um, I was going to other people's rallies, and I, w- I was ripping up people's signs for Ron Paul and for Rick Santorum. And I was, you know, I was the biggest R- Mitt Romney supporter there ever was. <laughs> wow. um, and what happened was I ended up meeting a lot of Ron Paul supporters. Um, because they were the really the only people that were willing to engage me intellectually uh, when I had, you know, uh, when I was holding on to a belief and I wanted to discuss it, um, especially at, at my school, Ave Maria University. And the Ron Paul supporters, like I said, were, were the best at, uh, you know, at laying things out on the line and, and getting things out there intellectually. And I was getting destroyed in debates. <laughs> Basically, every time I wanted to talk about something political, um, I wasn't making any sense. Um, the logic w- w- just wasn't there, and Ron Paul became a figure in my life that I wanted to learn more about. It was well, okay, well, how is this guy so good at debating, and well, why are his arguments so logical? Why are his followers so astute when they when they're <laughs> arguing? So I did a lot of research, and I uh, the first book I actually came upon was um, A Nation of Sheep by Judge Andrew Napolitano, and I read that, which led me to The Revolution by Ron Paul, uh, which led me to I believe, which is led, what led me to uh, my rediscovering of Tom Woods, because I had known Tom Woods, uh, you know, very, very little, just through, I'd seen him on Fox News like once or twice, I'd seen him on CNN once or twice, and I'd always think, I always thought he was such an idiot, because I thought he was a bleed heart, bleeding heart liberal, <laughs> um, because whenever he, was, he would argue with Bill O'Reilly or Glenn Beck or whoever they had on, so that led me to Tom Woods, um, watching his, his speeches at, at Mises University and watching... Um, his different videos at, at, at YAL conferences and YAF conferences and all these things. And um, that led me to a, a couple of his books, which led me to Murray Rothbard, which led me on this uh, moral 
trend that led me towards you know Plato and Aristotle, and that led me even deeper into metaphysics. And it was a, it was a whole spiral out of control. And now I, I refer to myself as a volunteerist libertarian. Nice, <clears throat> yeah. You know, I think um, one thing about um, most volunteerists is uh, and, and libertarians is that um, I think you have to be really um, humble about your beliefs because most of us did not you know we're not born like this you know we didn't grow up with you know volunteerist parents or libertarian parents most of us came from status households and so in order to um progress and evolve in our thinking we had to be humble enough to put our ideas like on the altar of logic and reason and then make the decision like you know what this doesn't hold up (laughs) <laughs> right and, and, and be truthful with yourself right <laughs> that's basically what happened with me was because i because i you know what this is what actually led me to law school as well as i i love to debate i love to talk about things i mean it could, it could be anything from philosophy to religion to politics i love to, to do that so when i was losing i also have a huge desire to win when i was losing these arguments it just you know set a fire in me to find out well what why am i losing what's going on here what the logic is just not there, so how can I get the logic to back me up on my side? And that's what led me to the liberty movement. Okay, so um, did you did you start studying law like as you made the transition to volunteerism, or or was that before? Well, I actually went into right after the 2012 debate. Um, towards the end, actually, once I realized that Romney had no chance, I actually started supporting <laughs> Ron Paul. As uh, as funny as that sounds, because Ron Paul really had no shot. But just the fact that what he was saying was so solid, solidly, you know, had such a solid foundation, um, I thought that that was something I was definitely interested in. And um, it led me to actually choose a major in politics and, um, and subsequently history just because I think the two are very intertwined. Okay, so now if you can explain to the people, to the listeners, um, the apparent contradiction of, of being an, an anarchist or a voluntarist who, you know, does not believe in the man-made arbitrary laws, um, how can such a person study law and well, be, and be I, consistent? I, I, well, yeah, of course. I think that it's, it's definitely important to remember that anarchy does not mean with, without rules. Mm-hmm. It means without rulers right. um, coming from the Greek. So mm-hmm. when you think about that, the key that I think that would, that would lead more so towards, a, towards a, a free society would be decentralizing law. Mm-hmm. So law is going to be very prevalent. Well, exactly what I'm studying now, which would be you know everything from contracts to property law to um, family law to probating wills. I mean, these are all things that are going to be very viable in a free society. And just like um, police are going to be needed, just like military is going to be needed in a free society, I think law is is just as equally going to be needed. Have you have you read any books on um, like on um you know, theories of how voluntary society might work and how, you know, uh, uh, you know, how law might work and how education might work, how roads might work. One of the one of the best. Oh, I mean, if we're talking about roads, I think who will build the roads by Walter Block is probably one of the best books I ever read. If you're talking about that. Nice. But in, ter- in, in terms of law, in terms of private law, mm-hmm. I think there is nobody that is better um, on this planet right now in explaining how it will work in a free society than David Friedman. Um, David Friedman, obviously the son of Milton Friedman, Mm -hmm. uh, coming from a little bit different background than I think you and me. I think we're more um, philosophically voluntarist, where Mm -hmm. we believe in a a moral standard. David Friedman comes from a consequentialist Mm -hmm. uh, background, which believes that if if we have people in society that don't believe in in ethics, that don't believe in morals, um, the liberty movement will still produce the best results outside of, of both what I said before, morals and ethics. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Usually when I, uh, you know, when people talk to me or, or when, I, when I mention, you know, talk about volunteerism and, um, you know, and they ask me those questions, you know, who would do this? Who would, you know, who would build the roads? Who would, well, how would we take care of the poor and the sick and the elderly? And right. so it's kind of like um, a, uh, what do you call that? I guess like a pragmatic approach, like who's going to do this? Right. Right. And, I, and, and I, I don't, I don't like to take that approach because, I'm not a fortune teller. I'm not an oracle. I don't know the future. I, I don't know what the market's going to produce when all of these restrictions on, on, uh, on you know, entrepreneurs are lifted in the form of you know, regulations and taxes. I don't know what they're going to produce. All I know is 
is, um, you know, the initiation of, of force is, is immoral, right? <laughs> On peaceful right. people. That's all I know. Right. And that's, that's all I think is necessary to know. You know, it's not necessary to be a fortune teller and see or, or in, in, envision how a stateless society, but people feel like they need to have this assurance. Yeah, well, Danilo, I think it goes back to um, what another one of my, my biggest idols in the, in the liberty movement is Adam Kokesh, mm -hmm. when he says that just because you can't decide or you can't come up with an idea what how would something would work doesn't mean there isn't a way that it could work. Mm -hmm. Just because we, if a person doesn't know how roads would be built without, a society, without government, mm -hmm. that doesn't mean that they're not going to get built. I mean, I don't know how to make an iPhone. I don't know how to do a lot of these things, but they get done and they get done in the private sector. Exactly. So, so can you can you give an example, I guess, of of how you envision like private law may work? Because that's such a foreign concept. Because because law, as most people understand it, is like one standard that applies to everybody universally, right? In in a particular geographical right. region. So so how would private law? I mean, would it be like like how it used to be, like just you know, in the states, in the in a local level, like that, I, I, something like that? I assume. Well, well, I think if we're talking about a free society, we're mm -hmm. talking about abolishing the state, correct? Right, right, right. So if we're talking about abolishing the state, um, I think we could look. It's very simple. Um, how what would be the private sector alternative to what we have now? Well, what we have now is a court system, mm -hmm. which is an, which is a, basically a dispute resolution mm -hmm. system. Mm -hmm. um, that would ve be very viable in a free society because if you have contracts, if you have property, if you're recognizing these things, you're going to need um, organizations that come through and are able to solve these disputes. Mm -hmm. So, and the, the 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 number one argument I always get against um, stuff like this is people won't agree. People won't agree on a, on a dispute resolution organization, or they won't agree on the laws. But I think if you look, w what happens now? I mean, if if some people some people believe abortions wrong, some people believe abortions just. So, or the same thing with heroin. Some people think heroin should be allowed. Some people don't think it is. What happens now? People uh, still act civilized. They respect the law. They act civilly in their disagreements. They go to court and they do these things because that's. The, the better way because violence is costly and because si uh, human beings are civilized. Mm. Um, if they can't act, if, if you can go act, if you can act civil enough to go to a voting booth to try to change things, what makes you think that that's going to change in a market where your opinions are truly heard? Right. Yeah. W one of the uh, one of the best books I read on this topic is um, uh, "Market for Liberty" by uh, Linda Tannehill and okay. L Linda Morris Tannehill. It's like written in the seventies. Yeah. And um and yeah, that was a pretty awesome book. I read it twice and I rarely read books twice. <laughs> so it was yeah, very very fascinating. And like you said, like yeah, it's it's very logical to expect that in a in a society where um you know, there is no, you know, overarching monopoly on violence or government, um you know, property rights and contract would reign supreme, right? Because um, like you, you can even look in the, um, you know, the quote Wild West, where you know, as they were expanding the frontier, um, there was really no no government that was over overseeing those people. Yet, you know, I, I mean, if you just have to discount the government schooling propaganda of it being the violent Wild West, <laughs> and exactly, then, and then you understand that no, these people were not savages. They actually got along through through enactment of of contracts, right, and well, mutual people... understanding. Danilo, what people don't realize is the the Wild West or westward expansion, whatever we want to call it, was one of the safest times in, in, in American history. I mean, just to see the expansion that we had, the, the roads that were built, the oil industry, the gold digging industry, I mean, mm -hmm. all these things. Towns were built, families mm -hmm. were made, I mean, communities were, were built from the dirt. And this happened all without a government, without all, without a, especially without a centralized government, mm -hmm. without police. I mean, the... the <laughs> The, the right to bear arms is obviously um, sacrosanct in, in terms of looking at the pragmatic approaches that are alternative to government services. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so this is a good um, a good segue into your other um, subject. So, the what are the pragmatic approaches that you think are necessary for people to take to um, advance the cause of liberty in their lives? Well, I'm actually, um, you know, that's a great question. Um, what I'm what I'm actually positing right now is the act of secession, and I think that people need to start to wake up and realize that this government is headed more and more down a drastic turn, and we are we're not going back towards more limited government. We're not going to have any chance to get to where we want to get without some type of governmental action, without some type of 
um, legal action in this system. So as a lawyer, this is one of the things I'm really going to look forward to studying because um, I, I took a lot of constitutional law in undergrad as well. But um, I'm thinking that we're going to need um, some type of Artifi Article 5 convention um, in which we can try to amend the Constitution completely. Um, I, I don't know if, you, if you've heard of Mark Levin. Um, sounds familiar. Conservative commentator. Um, not a real, I'm not a real big fan of his. He's a, he's a neoconservative. But he wrote a okay. book called The Liberty Amendments. Okay in which he talks about redrafting the Constitution, where conservatives should call for a redrafting of the Constitution because we will find out where our populace stands. Mm -hmm. Because if you have socialist and progressive um, aspects in being added into that, we'll realize that we've lost the republic as it is, and it's time to start over. Mm -hmm. So I think calling for an Article 5 convention, which wouldn't take much, it would just take two-thirds of the vote um, in the House and the, and the Senate, and... Um, I think that would be a great start. I think people should start pushing for that. There's, a def there's plenty of petitions going around right now. Um, and the second thing is the legal right to secession, where if we can have a, a governor or a uh, state legislature that, that grows the balls mm -hmm. to decide to, you know, like, like I don't want to say Texas, but that looks like where it's going right now. They've been talking about it for, for dozens of years um, to actually, you know, call upon our forefathers and call upon how this country was actually started and, and reduce reduce ourselves back to a state, which is what we were supposed to be in the first place, a, a, a collection of states. Yeah, yeah, that, that um, reminds me of, um, of Murray Rothbard's quote, um, you know, basically saying, you know, if, if Canada and United States can be separate, you know, why can't the states be separate from each other, right, and the cities be separate from each other, and the towns, right. and, the, and, and the road, and, and the, you know, the streets, and the houses, <laughs> and the, all the way down to the people, right, right? because, because, well, uh, the go ahead, go ahead. The states, the states were called states because that's what it, it's what a state is. I mean, it's the same thing as the state of France or the state of Israel. Mm -hmm. It was uh, the state of Pennsylvania was supposed to be its own independent state. Mm -hmm. It entered into the union on its own. It only delegated the it delegated powers whenever it so it was able to retain any powers that it had previously. If you're able to retain them, you've had them already, so you can just take them back at any time. And that was the point, is most of the states only entered into the Union under after the Articles of Confederation. They only signed the Constitution because there was express written consent that they would have the power to take back if the government got too large. You know, interesting, you said before about um, it's legal, right, secession is legal. Um, <laughs> and I guess that might have been the, uh, the approach that the, that the southern states took you know, right before the uh, the War of Northern Aggression, <laughs> right? <laughs> and they said it's legal. What what we're right. doing is legal, and 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 then five hundred thousand people die. So, <laughs> right. Well, we're, we were they see that what what was great was the, the North had uh, s slavery to pin as the problem and the reason why mm -hmm. they would they would act so violently against the South. Right. Um, if a state like Texas did that today, th there's really nothing that the government can point to and say, well. We have to go in. We have to stop this. This is this is immoral. Mm -hmm. And I think now, especially as our 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 society is going more and more towards political correctness, more and more towards um, just I, I would I would say more of a feminist view mm -hmm. on the world. I mean, everything's kind of. If you look at a GQ magazine, everything's kind of getting more and more feminine. Um, <laughs> I just don't see. I think this is a great time, and I think this is a time for men to stand up and uh, take back what we what we what we have. Right, right, exactly. Um, so, so let me let's discuss some of your other articles. Um, so, let's see. So, there's no such thing as a as a necessary evil. So, what do you what what, what were you um, talking about in that article? Well, the thing is, a lot of uh, conservatives, Republicans, they always talk about how America is the greatest country on this planet. Mm -hmm. They never talk about why. And they, they say freedom, they say, uh, you know, diversity, all these things, but it, it, we're, we're not even close to the freest country on this planet. So you can't say we're the greatest country because we're the freest because that's a non sequitur. <laughs> so <laughs> what you have to do is you have to look at what made this country the superpower that it is and what made it the, the people flourish. And I think that if you look at it, there's no doubt that this country at one point had the most amount of free market capitalism in the history of the world. So if we look at what is good and what is bad, what is it that has been, you know, a tumor on the American people's leg that has been holding us down, that has been taking, that has been a disallowing us from reaching the precipice of greatness, and that's government. So when, when you say there's a necessary evil, 
it's it's just it it doesn't follow and it it, it it's a complete contradiction like we were talking about before mm-hmm. how is it that we can as promoters of the free market how can we endorse a coercive monopolized system that's completely anti anti capitalistic yeah yeah definitely you know as uh you know we were talking about before that a um you know the a necessary evil is an oxymoron right <laughs> because if something is necessary then it's not evil and if it's evil right. it's unnecessary um but but so so going back to what you said before about um um you said you know you said petitioning the government for for or the state government for for secession um so so um would you be would you be in favor of, like supporting the libertarian party like um you know using using the government or or, or nullification or you know, using the government to reduce government basically would you be uh, in favor of that? I, I want to say yes, I really do. Um, but I don't think the Libertarian Party has uh, a voluntarist mindset. Um, I think that if th- there was a great debate um, between Bob Murphy and Walter Block in which they talked about whether, whether it's moral for a Libertarian to vote for the most Libertarian candidate in the election. Mm. Walter Block took the position that, yes, it is. Nope. Um, I was more so siding with Bob Murphy just because I think that this system is so broken, is so bad, that the only thing back to a state level, um, and maybe, so, so to, to answer your question succinctly, I think that I would support somebody on the community or state level, but I would not support them on the federal level. Yeah, yeah, because there are a lot of um, you know anarchists that are running for public office, but perhaps not necessarily to take public office, but just to spread the message of of liberty and volunteerism in the in the same way that uh, that Ron Paul was doing. You know, like um, I don't think he ever really expected to be elected, and I I was really hoping he wouldn't be elected because I I thought if he would be elected, then uh, he would he would sustain some you know freak accident <laughs> um, because I I I don't I don't really think it's um how you say I don't think it's realistic like for for somebody to be elected like for example Adam Kokesh right he's he's running for, on uh, in 2020 right so he, and he's an anarchist he's a volunteerist and he he's running on the platform of the peaceful dissolution of the federal government right now I don't see him if he does win the far off chance that he does I don't see him calmly dissolving every single federal agency and then not encountering you know stumbling or roadblocks or assassination attempts <laughs> like I just don't see that happening I mean do you think that's what, what right. do you think about that? I, I tend to agree 100. percent And this is why I, I think that anytime you try to get something done at the federal level, um, where you where you have over 315 million people deciding, you have 716 thousand people per representative in Congress. I mean, it's 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 just an absurdity. If you go back and you look at Aristotle and when he talks about that, <laughs> you you can't have anything more than a community government because anything past that's going to be tyrannical. Mm. And you look at whenever throughout history. Whenever there's been tyrannies and a lack of diversity and all these things, it's all been through a centralized, huge, and has historically been the times of human growth. Um, especially, I mean, if, even going back to look at the Catholic Church when it had its reign in, in, in medieval Europe, I mean, the Enlightenment period happened through decentralization of thought, where things were, I mean, we wouldn't have the things if, um, if it was still centralized under those, under, under those authorities. We wouldn't have things like air conditioning and cars and phones and these things. We would be living something, sort, something closer to that of the Middle East. And we, we always talk about how they're living in the, in the ninth, ninth century. Well, that's because if you look at throughout history, the, the best times for human development throughout time were decentralized through decentralized power. Where if you look at Renaissance Florence, you look at the city-states in Greece, you look at um, right after the Constitution was drafted, uh, after um, how it was all states' rights. These things are, are definitely something that we need to look at, especially if you look at stuff like uh, the medieval times and when the Catholic Church was so influential in Europe. I mean, they had all the power. All this was a monolithic government, so, at, so far as to say. And I think that after the Enlightenment period was a decentralization of thought um, in which we were able to progress forward as a species. And I think that as we get closer and closer to decentralization of power and decentralization of, of thought, like we were talking about before with government schools, um, I think we'll be much better off and, our, and for generations to come. Yeah, you know, it's funny when, you know, people make that, that non sequitur that, um, you know, government equals civilization, <laughs> right? right? Everything good that has happened is because of 
the government <laughs> right. because of the parasite, right. right? And and it's like it's like you know they like we would have never had you know we've never gone to space, never had NASA, we would have never educated people, we would have you know people would be starving, all this kind of stuff. And uh, and and I think there's one quote that, that said I forgot who said it, but he's like you know if government gave us all our foods like breakfast, lunch, and dinner, <coughs> people today would be saying. If it wasn't for government, we wouldn't we wouldn't have food. <laughs> like we wouldn't be right, eating. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah, there's uh, it, it's kind of like what they did in the Soviet Union, which is what people used to ask. There was uh, a billboard that used to ask, "Well, if it wasn't for the government, who would supply who would supply the bread?" <laughs> right. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, like and and I made a com a, a post on Facebook. You know, you see a guy, um, you know, but the basic Occupy Wall Street type guy, you know, with his Starbucks mug, with his is this nice, you know, nice laptop bag with with his, uh, right. you know, and then he's like, "Capitalism sucks, you know, you owe me, right?" So basic social justice warrior, and 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 so, and I talk, and I said a little something, and then and then one guy commented, and he's like, "Really? So, but but we have Facebook thanks to government." <laughs> I'm like, wait, 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 what? what? <laughs> this is the this is the absurdity, Danilo. This is the absurdity of where we're headed. When you have the government controlling the education system, there is nothing left. This right. is where people are getting their information from. <laughs> exactly. So there is a there is a complete. I mean, what incentive do they have to not educate our our kids like this? Uh -huh. What what incentive do they have to tell the truth? Because at the end of the day, they end up creating a dependent class. Mm -hmm. The dependent class keeps them in power and keeps their their pockets fat. So. Mm -hmm. It's up to us as, as citizens now to say, okay, well, centralization of all this power has extended its hands, its tentacles into yeah. everything. Yeah, exactly. It's time for us now to find pragmatic ways in which we can get those tentacles out of our, out of our children, out of our minds, and out of our pockets. Yeah, so, so with me, you know, when people ask me, um, you know, like, Daniela, they say, I, I see that you complain a lot about, about the government, about, you know, war and a, a third reserve and... and um, you know all these taxes and regulations. I see that. So, what should I do? Should I should I become a politician? Should I should I join and change it from the inside? Should I make, write new laws? <laughs> should I vote? Which which politicians should I support? And one of the things I say is actually the uh, article that J uh, Justin Moldau wrote a while ago, which actually my wife sent to me even before I met Justin. It was kind of interesting. She's like, it, and the article was um, politics is a waste of time, <laughs> and 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 I tell them. If you want to improve the world, you have to first start with yourself, right? It always comes back to the individual, right? Stop trying to, like, affect the, a politician that you think is going to make a change, that's going to improve the lives of millions of people. You have no control over that whatsoever. You have control over yourself, mostly. Your kids, that's to be, that can be debated, <laughs> you know? Outside of that, you, you know, barely can control your spouse. So basically, you can control yourself. That's it. So you want to make a positive change, improve yourself, you know, make yourself into a, a moral, decent, you know, respectable, compassionate human being. And hopefully, you can raise your kids to be a similar way, right? You can pass on your principles and your, your morality to your kids. And that, to me, that's how, when you, when you really want to change the world, you start small okay because you know people advocating for the minimum wage they have no idea about economics and how that's going to affect the small business owner how that's going to affect you know the the worker that that has no skills you know they have no idea of the of the long long uh you know the butterfly effects of these of these um legislation so that's right. what i tell people and th this is the scary part is that actually why i'm actually a little bit optimistic going into this next election is because i think we're headed down such a bad path that it's only a matter of time now before conservatives, progressives, Democrats, Republicans alike all start getting fed up. And I think that it's at a point now, and I always say this, I said this the other day on our podcast on, on Liberty Hangout, um, when northern laws come to southern states, I think that that is when people are actually going to start waking up. And I think that if, because me coming from New York, the Socialist Republic of New York, now living in, in a state where we consider more free, um, I think that if the laws in New York were instituted in Texas or Louisiana or Alabama, it, it, the people would go haywire. <laughs> if the, if, All right. <laughs> so, and I, this is why I love, I, I have a lot of friends in the military. I love talking to members of the military. They are all about um, freedom, for pretty much. They're all about the Second Amendment. They're all about the First Amendment. This is, these are things they fight for. They fight for their families. They fight for these things. Now, they're, like Adam Kokesh alludes to a lot of the time, is that they're bamboozled into thinking that they're fighting for the right reasons, and, and a lot of the times they're not. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that 
once the once these things once these things happen, once a Bernie Sanders or a Hillary Clinton starts, uh, you know, kind of putting all these huge big government laws in places where they never thought they could be, I think that that's when we'll see actual real change, and I'm actually excited for it. Right, exactly. So, so can you go into your your other article, the um, the death of the petrodollar? Of course. Um, basically, the United States is the world reserve currency. Um, it's been that way since Great Britain relinquished it to us, uh, because basically their money was no good anymore at the time. And um, what happened was every government that we have uh, gone in and overthrown, whether it be in Iraq, Iraq, Syria, Libya, Yemen. Um, these have all been governments that have tried to wean themselves off of selling uh, oil in U.S. dollars. Mm -hmm. And there's a direct correlation between the two. Um, I think that now we're looking at a change where Russia is trying to make a play in the Middle East um, with, in, a, in association with China and Iran. Um, and they're going to try to move it over to now have oil sold in rubles, um, which, is, which is the currency that, they, uh, that their partnership would, would, would endorse. Mm. And once we lose... The world reserve currency are basically our dollar will have no nothing to really stabilize it like it is now with the Federal Reserve printing. Um, I forget how how absurd it is dollar per second. So that's that's <laughs> right. something that's that's going on. That's definitely people should be paying attention to that the mainstream media won't cover. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that was what that article was about. Yeah, the um, the monetary system and precious metals um, was basically how I got. Um, interested in volunteerism that's what got me started you know my interest in precious metals and the, and the specific book was the Cre creature from jekyll island by g edward griffin yeah, of course oh it's an awesome book and it really you know really opened my eyes to so many things um uh, and 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 then um and then i started following mike maloney from goldsilver.com he makes a documentary called uh, hidden secrets of money and one of them that you kind of reminded me of was um episode three which is called the golden nails in the coffin of the dollar and uh, and basically he's going since 1971, right when uh, Nixon took us off of the gold standard, um, became complete fiat currency. All the countries all over the world became fiat currency, pure fiat currency. Um, right. Um, then since then that that's the first nail, right? And then and then um, like the past maybe like the past five years, something like that, five, six, seven years. The, the nails have really been coming quite successively, you know, like, you know, all these countries like Russia and China and Australia and the BRICS countries and, you know, um, Libya and Syria, like you said, trying to get off of the world reserve currency, trying to, you know, do bilateral trade agreements in their own currencies, try to trade, um, you know, things in, in, in uh, gold or in oil. Um, and then you know what a surprise they get invaded, <laughs> and, and their and their leaders get assassinated. What a surprise! And and all of a sudden they have a central bank. What a surprise! You know, <laughs> of um, course. You know, and I, I tell people uh, one of the interesting things I tell people is that before nine eleven, there were seven countries that were not on uh, that did, did not have a central bank, and after nine eleven. Two countries got a central bank, right? Can you guess which ones? Um, <laughs> Afghanistan <laughs> and Iraq. Iran. Now, did, yeah. that, that, or, yeah, or, did that have anything to do with 9-11, <laughs> do you think? <laughs> like, I don't know. I mean, and, and people, it, you know, and once the central bank gets a hold of this country and just, you know, strangles it with debt, right? And, and this all this imaginary credit and fake money. Um, it's, you know, how do you extricate yourself from that? They just, they can't. And it's just, it's an easy way to overthrow a country. You know, I think John Adams, uh, famous quote is, uh, there are two ways to, to overthrow a country, right? By the sword and by debt, right? Right. <laughs> and I think, I think the, the latter way is the, is the much easier way to overthrow a country. And I think we're definitely headed down that path. Hey, you know, why is it that nobody's talking about this in the presidential debates? Why is it? <laughs> Why is it nobody's talking about this at the eight o'clock hour on Fox News? I mean, right. Brett Baer reports. Why are you not reporting about the Federal Reserve literally milking us to death? Exactly, and exactly. It's it's kind of funny. Like uh, I like talking about the Federal Reserve because and and actually, you know, you know, when you talk about, let's say, you talk about immigration, right? Or you right. talk about, um, you know, um, I don't know. Any, anything that's like volatile, you know, in, in American politics, you know, healthcare, let's say, universal healthcare. Right. You talk about these things, people get emotional, they get reactionary, they get defensive, right? But when you start talking about precious metals and Austrian economics, 
nobody cares. Nobody cares about those things. Nobody has an opinion about gold and silver, right? Or even about the Federal Reserve. They don't even know what it is at all. It is printed on the currency that people use every single day, and they don't even know what it is. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> it, it, it's funny that you're born, you you spend 12 years in a government school. Right. If you're lucky, you go to a government college. And then you go out and you work a government job or you go into the workforce and you're competing against government jobs and right. you're, you're watching government controlled media and corporate, corporate uh, lobbyists mm -hmm. and, and buyouts that are happening that these things are ridiculous where they're so intertwined mm -hmm. that we're all just so blinded and so um, just indoctrinated at, to a point. And it's, it's only going to get worse, which, is, uh, which I take solace in. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, yeah. Definitely, the trajectory of government is to expand um, and bloat and you know siphon off um, um, you know wealth and productivity from the industrious until it cannot be sustained anymore. And then, and then that's when you see you know the wealth transfer and the collapse and things. And and that's one of the things that Mike Maloney um, has documented in his book. Um, it's a rich dad, um, rich, rich dad's guide to investing in precious metals. Awesome, awesome book. I highly recommend it. Um, you know, he talks about the wealth cycles, about how how um you know thousands of years gold and silver have been used in uh, various cultures and they've never gone to zero right but how many fiat currencies have been have been used and they've all gone to zero 100 percent fatality rate right none of them have sorry and we really think that the u.s dollar is going to be special <laughs> no we don't we don't that's the thing is it's we're now on a on a fiery wagon that's headed towards a cliff and basically, we're just taking, we're throwing all the all the buckets of beer off the that, so we have something when we when the wagon actually does crash, the rich and the powerful will have something to, to have, rest their head on. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And and uh, you know, one thing I like to say, say to people is during uh, the Weimar Republic, um, as they were you know hyperinflating their currency between like I think it's nine, um, it was like nineteen nineteen to nineteen twenty four, right? Five years it took for the um, the German mark to inflate to to. To worthlessness, and um, I tell people in 1919, right, 100 German marks bought um, one ounce of gold, right, and then they inflated the currency so much. 1924, it was like 100 trillion German marks bought one ounce of gold, and so at that point, at that was the height of the wealth transfer, and gold was so valuable, overvalued, that um, like 25 ounces of gold could buy one ounce, one one block of commercial real estate. In in uh in the city of Germany, right in in major cities. So and it's, it's like right. imagine imagine what that means in Manhattan. Like one block of commercial real estate. How much does that cost today? <laughs> exactly. And it can give you exactly. an idea of how overvalued precious metals can be when there are, are currency crises. Right. And, and th this is another point I tried to make was as astute American citizens like you and me, we we really have to start considering what the, what is the next move of our government going to be. We, I mean, we support uh, our our people are supporting this government with massive tax money, and and consent through the democratic system, which is unbelievable at this point to see that people are so ignorant to the fact of what's happening and the, the current tra trajectory that we're on. It can't sustain itself. So I think that what what led me to write this article was to see well, okay, all these things are happening. Who's benefiting from these? Because I think it's very true. If you follow the money, you'll find out who is actually benefiting, who's pulling the strings mm. of these politicians, of these corporations, what's actually happening. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that was something that really opened my eyes through the research that I did for it. And, and actually, um, <clears throat> talking about the, uh, the petrodollar and, uh, and the Federal Reserve um, kind of got me thinking about Occupy Wall Street and how um, <clears throat> people, you know, when I talk about, um, you know, volunteerism and, and about government, and what it what's true nature is and people say oh so you must be you must be a supporter of the occupy wall street <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and and i'm telling them like see so what you're doing is these the you know wall street that's like that's like got you know so many ties to um politicians on capitol hill right <clears throat> you're telling them you're telling the politicians to rein them in <laughs> when they're the ones that help them cause the problem and and steal from the middle class, <laughs> I, so you're begging the politicians basically. I I could li I could literally listen to you talk about this all day. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, it's and, and then actually I remember there. I don't know if you you saw um, um, <clears throat> Peter Schiff uh, when he went down the Occupy Wall Street. He did a video like like um, ask me. I'm the one percent. <laughs> did you see that? Did you see that at all? I didn't. I didn't. Get oh, to see you got to check that out. He just put it. He, he put up his sign. He says, "I am the one percent. Let's talk." <laughs> and 
<laughs> and, That's awesome. And so Good people came up to him and were and were saying, you know, how could you be, how could you uh, support, you know, Wall Street? He's like, well, I don't. It's just that you're you're petitioning, you're 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 protesting the wrong people. You should be down in Capitol Hill. That's what you should be protesting. <laughs> they're the ones who really cause the problem. These people, they're just like, um, <clears throat> how do you say? They're like they're like piggybacking on the ride you know, right. of the thief, right? They're not the thief themselves. They're just, they're, they're, they're making use of the system. They're, um, <clears throat> you know, it's like, it's like the, the system is set up in such a way that those, those who will benefit are those who will, who will, um, you know, become entangled and close to those in power. All right. You know, so anyone who gets close to government, that's how you really get ahead. You know, if you don't want to compete, you don't want to do it the old fashioned way. <laughs> right. <clears throat> Right. You monopolize and you and you start infiltrating the system through <laughs> buyouts and backdoor deals and all these things that happen in our in our political s- system that are just h- heading us for disaster. So so let me let me ask you in your um you know when you're in class in, in your studies do you do you talk to your 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 teachers or your or your uh, friends in the cl- in class about any of these topics? Um I try to. See the the problem is everyone deflects back towards gay marriage and marijuana legalization like those are the greatest two things that are ever we should ever be talking about in this country um, because they really don't know what else to talk about because when you're indoctrinated by MSNBC and Fox right. News right. those are the two <laughs> those are the two things that are only talked about so that and do black lives matter or do all lives matter so <laughs> what we end up looking at is um, an uninformed populace and a especially in, in academia which is so sad to see but there's people that are opening their eyes, and that, that I also start to see is to do through alternative media, through people like um, Russia Today and Adam Kokesh and Peter Schiff and, and, and Tom Woods and, and a lot of these guys, even people like Peter Joseph from the Zeitgeist Movement, mm-hmm. um, even people like, um, uh, I, I'm not a big fan, but Chris Cantwell, like these guys are all, they're all leading us towards, you know, decentralizing the media market, decentralizing where we get our information from, and guys like Alex Jones, and I, I, I love them for that. Um, it was, I, recently, I went up to a conference, a, a conservative conference up in New Hampshire in, in March, actually. And I was sitting at a table with a bunch of young Republicans. And the question came up, what do, they th- what do you think about Alex Jones? And basically, it got, everyone was like, he's a traitor to this country. He can't do anything right, blah, blah, blah. All I said was, guys, don't you think he's necessary to an extent? Don't you think, just using him as a figurehead, don't you think that having people that come out and say, even if they are outlandish things or if they're a little outrageous, it's good to keep the government and the, and the 1% at, at bay and keep them on their toes because at the end of the day, we need people out there exposing these things, um, which is what I'm trying to do in the law field where, where I'm starting to realize now that how messed up our system of, of legislation is and how our, our crime system and how our or even our civil litigation system is so messed up and nobody's drawing attention to it. Um, so this is something, something that I'm definitely interested in. That um, I'm glad that people, especially like you, Danilo, for having shows like this and admitting pages and doing these things because this is what's going to take us to the next step. Yeah, yeah, definitely spreading the message. Um, so, so let me. So you also wrote a, um, an article on um, abolishing the police, and one thing came to mind. Um, because you're studying law, and and I, I remember reading somewhere that um, it's very ironic that um, you know somebody who studies law goes through you know many years of study, and then you know you got to pass all these exams and, and different things, and and then you um, <clears throat> you know when, when somebody commits a crime, then you you know a, a case can take you know many months or even years maybe, um, and then and then you have police, and how many people are killed on the streets by police, completely innocent, right? So in, 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 in essence, the, the police officer is acting as judge, jury, and executioner, <laughs> right? right? And I, what, I feel bad, what I feel bad, I actually pity police um, to, to an extent just because they are in a system in which they are responsible to these corrupt politicians and corporations that are in cahoots with each other. And now they're the ones, they're the face out on the street enforcing these laws. Enforcing the wills of these politicians because mm-hmm. these politicians don't have the balls to go out and do it themselves. Yeah. So now police are forced to do it. And th- 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 at the end of the day, a lot of policemen are, are forced into a system where this is the best thing that they could have done in their life. This gives them a position of power. It gives them uh, authority. It gives them control of the, over other people. They were never going to be able to get a, a decent education most of the time. I mean, don't get me wrong. There are some police officers that have decent educations and all this thing. But this is what the system sets you up for. It sets you up for the military. 
It sets you. I mean, you could go in, and, and I'm going to get a lot of flack for saying this, but you can go into the military. I bet my ass on it right now. 75% of the people in the military are not in it for love of country. I mean, I talked to a Marine the other day, and I said, and I was with a bunch of conservatives, and they were all telling him how much they appreciated his service, how much they loved him. And he said, guys, to tell you the truth, I'm doing this for the paycheck. <laughs> yeah, right. He said, exactly. when, when I got out of high school, he goes, I had nothing, I had nothing else I could do. Right. And yeah. my heart bled for that guy because at the end of the day, this is what the system is, is doing. Mm. This is what it's, it's promoting for, for sociopaths and for people that, that want to you know, protect their families. And mm. this is the only way they can go. <laughs> Yeah, and it's really amazing to me how, you know, people defend uh, government schools, but then, you know, then you have to think about, like, wait a minute, you you went to government school for 12 years, and you're telling me you can barely hold down a minimum wage job? <laughs> now, what well, kind of a reflection of that is on the edu- quote, education? <laughs> well, I mean, who wants to hold down a minimum wage job when you get paid more than minimum wage in the military? You right. get paid more than minimum wage as a cop. So these right. are things, I mean, these are government positions. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of cities, they're not too, it, it's not too hard to become a cop. Some cities it is because there's such a waiting list because there's more, I think there's a, a def- direct correlation between how many government schools you have in a city to how many people want to become a police officer <laughs> <laughs> right. or want to join the military. I mean, right. this is where the system is headed. And the more we, exactly what we talked about at the beginning of this interview was decentralization. We need to start decentralizing school, decentralizing media, decentralizing where people get their information from so that we can combat against this intellectually, not only physically out on the street doing podcasts, but with our minds, with um, words, with reading, with books, with telling other people, with having arguments. This is where we need to go. Yeah, the and some people, you know, really um, think that um, you know going out and protesting and picketing and you know walking around with signs that um, you know that's the best way to go and and you know if if you really want to do that, go ahead. But I don't recommend that because from what I've seen, um, those events attract a large amount of violence, right? Because police in riot gear, right? They they're the ones that are at those kind of events, right? And so you know, and at the drop of a hat, somebody gets violent, and everyone gets violent, and then you know becomes like a mob. And then, and, and then the funniest part is how the media skews it. So you have something like the Bundy Ranch, right, mm, where yeah. they were the federal government was trying to seize the property of the rancher in uh, New Mexico, right, or Nevada, excuse me, Nevada, uh-huh. and you you have. Uh, all types of groups like Oath Keepers, you have ex-military guys coming to the aid of this guy right. with their weapons, fully armed. Yeah. The federal government standing there fully armed. Yeah. Side to, you know, it was like uh, the Battle of Lexington and Concord. <laughs> and then you have the media skew him to be, they completely disregard what the actual substance of the issue was and skew him as a racist. <laughs> skew yeah. Mr. Bunny as a racist, like, like this was the thing. When the man had, didn't, has done substantial things for the minority communities in Nevada. So I thought that was so funny just to see how, or especially even with all these, you know, anything that happens with civil disobedience, they skew it that this was a a, a lunatic or anti-government or a terrorist. That's the, that's the number one thing now is we're all called terrorists. So this is where we're going. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, um, you know, one thing that Larkin Rose talks about a lot is how, you know, in, um, in, in the United States, you know, there's about like a hundred million people that own firearms, right? And most of them own multiple firearms. And so, so if they just give out, you know, lend out their firearms to a couple of people, everybody will be armed. Now, everybody, you know, 300 million people armed. Why do they still feel an obligation to obey a couple of twisted old sociopaths on Capitol Hill and allow them to rob those 300 million people? <laughs> well, it's the, it's the legitimacy. It's right. the legitimacy, right. legitimacy exactly. factor. Everyone sees this as legitimate. They've, they, they're taught – I mean this is the funny part. Is coming up, I was, I was taught the social contract and that I somehow have consented to be here and consented to the laws that I'm under. Right. So that this is what we're taught, and and then when you're taught this from birth, you learn it quicker, you learn it faster, and it stays with you longer. Yeah, it's so important. You know, like uh, I think I think it was Stalin that said, you know, if you give if you give me your child for four years, you know, uh, the seed that I plant will never be uprooted, and <laughs> and that's just four years, right? We have twelve years of of aggressive government indoctrination, right? And I always call it indoctrination because it's not learning because you don't have a choice in what you're learning. Learning is when you have a choice. You're like, I want to learn that. <laughs> that's learning. When you don't have a choice, that's not called learning. <laughs> you couldn't, you're preaching to the choir. You couldn't, you, you can't, you can't say that, oh, well, well you completely, you're, you're consenting to the system. And then when 
you don't want to go to school, well, we'll stick you and your parents in jail. <laughs> right. That, that's not learning. That's forced indoctrination, just like you said before. Right, right, right. So, yeah, legitimacy is really is really the uh, you know the meat of it because it really is what separates the mafia from government, right? The mafia's threats are not seen as law; they're just seen as threats, threats of violence, right? Or you know, their extortion is not seen as taxes; it's seen as extortion. <laughs> it's it's the cognitive it's the cognitive dissonance argument, where you say, well, do you do you trust the do you trust the mafia? No. Well, do you trust their orders? No. Do you trust? Do you trust government? No. Do you trust their orders? Yes. <laughs> it doesn't. It yeah. Doesn't follow. But yeah, um, it's gonna take. It's gonna take a long time to reverse um, the indoctrination that's occurred since I think the 18th century. Now, um, where you have people view uh, government as legitimate, the social contract as something that is prevalent in society and that is the finding final binding uh, authority on what you can and can't do. Yeah, and one thing that uh, when I talk to people who are you know pretty hardcore um, believers in government is uh, they never like to acknowledge the gun in the room. You know, like like I talk about you know government school, you're forced to go right. Talk about taxes, you're forced to pay right. Regulations, you're forced to comply, and and um, you know obey them. And then and then they say to me, well, Danilo, why do you keep saying this word force? I don't like you. I don't like it when you say this word force. It makes me feel uncomfortable. <laughs> Yeah, it, it was what happened on the uh, the floor of the Senate when Bernie Sanders and, and Rand Paul, when he was talking about how uh, we're going to mandate uh, nationalized health care. And, and Rand Paul said, well, if you mandate nationalized health care, in essence, what you're doing is putting a gun to every doctor's head that says, well, no, I don't feel like going into the office today. <laughs> yeah. So you're completely taking market incentives out of services. And once you do that, I think historically you see that the quality goes as well. Of course, of course. I mean, I mean, it's funny, you know, people talk about like, um, you know, countries with socialized health care, like, um, like Canada, right, and, and various countries in Europe. And one of the one of the best questions you can ask them is, um, how's your health? Do you have good health? Because if you do, then you really have no idea how the health care is, right? Because you're only going to know if you have bad health, and you actually have to use it, right? And your life depends on it. <laughs> because then you'll find out that most people flee the country or else because they don't want to be put on a six month waiting list <laughs> exactly or you're a senior citizen and uh once you pass 65 you're no longer covered for cancer treatment so you have to flee the country and go find somewhere where you can actually pay for it right right and, and it's basically the breakdown of you know you know when people begin to rely on government for these services it's like the breakdown of community bonds like like before you know the incentive was you know to raise your kids well to treat your neighbor well with, with respect because you know that one day you know you might be injured you, you might not be able to work and take care of yourself you might be too old and sick and so you want you want to know that you treated people so well that they would want to take care of you when you're not able to take care of yourself, right? But what's the incentive now when everybody relies on the government to do it? You know, it's, it's, you know there is no incentive to, to, to treat your neighbor well or raise your kids well, right? No, there's a short – I talk about this in my thesis. There's a short – when you have government-induced law, there's a short-circuiting that happens – um, on the human level, because now you're not, you're no longer allowed to decide for yourself what's right and wrong. You're no longer allowed to d d use a conscience or study morality. You're you're short circuited and you're told and mandated what is right and wrong. So something like, for example, I'm I'm pro life. Um, I think that uh, once a, a baby has a heartbeat, you no longer can kill it. I don't. It, I make the property rights argument being a non-religious person. But at the end of the day, how are you going to tell me that that's right? I I as a person cannot view killing another human being as right. But if the government mandates it, watch how quick people pick up on it. Watch how quick people will be able to come to the aid and defense of that argument. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and um, you know, I've been talking about this stuff so much that um, I, I never, it, it's amazing how I never, um, you know, use the word legal anymore. It's just really amazing. And when people, and I talk to people and they use that word legal, I just start laughing because it's so foreign to me now. And like, like, um, you know, I think I was, <laughs> I was with the, uh, uh, I, was, I was with some homeschooling families and, and we were playing by a lake and, and then one of the women said, is this legal? <laughs> I just burst out laughing like, what the <laughs> hell is wrong with you? Stop thinking about legal or legal. Everybody thinks like that. Is this legal? You know, <laughs> I always say we, we, we as libertarians, we don't believe in laws. We believe in principles. Right. And there you go. Yeah, I tell people, you know, your conscience should be your only the law that you obey. That's it, you know, because if, if 
you know, if, if there's there's no there's no teaching people morality. Like you know, you, you're raised a certain way. Hopefully, you know, you had great foundations, great you know parenting, and that and they instilled great principles in you. Because you know, it's very difficult once a person is you know in their twenties or thirties for to change a person. It's monumentally difficult, right? And and, and well, and, go ahead. No, no. I, I, the first question that was asked after I was done um, with my thesis was by a professor who taught at Princeton for about a dozen years. And her question was, how, what would happen if I had a gun on, in a free society? What would happen if I had a gun on a bus <laughs> and I was waving it around and there was, and there was no uh, you know, centralized law? What would happen then? I said, well, who owns the bus? Well, a bus company owns the bus. Okay, well, why would, the, why would a bus driver want to allow somebody with, because she also talked about him having flammables and, all, and, and a bomb and all these things. And I said, <laughs> why would the owner of a bus company want to have these things? Just because government didn't come in and say you can't do this doesn't mean that the market is totally going to disregard right. what works for people. And people are going to go haywire right. and not realize that they don't like sitting next to a guy that has a bomb and flammables. Right. So it's just the absurdity. I mean, just even at the highest levels of academia, the absurdity of, yeah. what the, of, 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 gov, of the government argument. Yeah, because you know, if we don't have police, it's gonna be chaos and mayhem and bloodshed and bodies laying in the street and no, nobody could get to work. And <laughs> it's funny, like my um, my wife was talking about FedEx. We had a FedEx package mailed, and and she's like, you know, I heard, I heard that FedEx, um, you know, their their packages are being stolen because people are like following the trucks, and then when they drop off the packages, people just steal the packages from the doorstep. And I'm like, oh, okay, that's interesting. So so you know, that's a private company, right? So. I imagine if that continues to happen, or or maybe they're already taking steps, that they would they would you know change the way they do things, right? In, in, employ some kind of additional security measure to make sure that doesn't happen. And initially, I thought <clears throat> she meant that the person was uh, like holding up the driver and stealing all the packages <laughs> in the truck. And I'm like, well, if that's true, then I'm sure that eventually FedEx would want their driver to be armed. Right to protect it, to protect their their cargo. Right, I think that would make sense. And then if you had a trigger happy FedEx driver, he would get fired. The company would be all over social media. They would be talking about don't don't support FedEx. They've right. done this. They've done that. Right. And that's how the market works. It's social ostracizing right. is so much better tool than than government force. And people need to start waking up to that because it it happens every day. Yeah. Go look at Zillow. Go look at uh, Yelp. Go look at all these right. Facebook reviews and amazon.com i mean this is how things work now mm -hmm. we're at the best times in in human history i think mm -hmm. to to yeah. have a society where we can be truly free yeah 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 there's there are so many self-regulated mechanisms like you said like yelp and you know amazon reviews and even consumer reports and and people use these things like you would never go you would never go to a government website to evaluate businesses <laughs> and and people you know they understand they intuitively i think understand how private businesses can provide you know things that we all love and appreciate but for some reason some you know twisted reason people think you know there are certain things that government has to do right like you know they have to they have to regulate industries or else industries will go crazy they have to provide for na national defense or else you know we're going to get invaded by right. china <laughs> which is kind of a funny argument when people say what if china invades i'm like so you, you're saying a billion people in China want to invade us? <laughs> is that what you're saying? Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> I, I write about this and I also wrote about this was that how is it that one takes over a completely decentralized free society? Right, Can you exactly. imagine tomorrow if we, if we abolished all the governments right. in America? Yeah. What, what happens is usually warfare is one government going over to take over the other government. Right, and right. then they take over their tax base. Exactly. But if you don't have a government or a tax base, <laughs> you have 315 million armed people with police services, with dispute services, with uh, decentralized military and, uh, and insurance companies that are armed. I mean, this is what you're up against. Yeah. It could be the greatest thing to ever happen. But... What, what, right. what do I know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and the, and, and the incentive in, in such a such a society would be to, um, you know, to employ the the best technology for defense, right? It, exactly, you know, and and tailor your approach specifically so that you can capitalize and keep money. Because if you look at the way governments go to war, they only have what they what they're expending for four years or eight years. So mm -hmm. basically, they're borrowing the military services, and they can expend them at, at, at the taxpayer's expense, mm -hmm. and they don't really have to be frugal with it. Yeah. But can you imagine if you have an insurance company that has its own private military, how they would tailor their approach so that they would save the most money while getting the most efficient results? Yeah.
Yeah, exactly. Well said. So, um, so I don't want to keep you uh, any longer. So, um, please tell the, tell my listeners how they can reach you and if they want to follow your work. Uh, you can find me at facebook.com slash James R. Uh, you can also find me at libertyhangout.org. And you can find me on YouTube. My thesis is called uh, Leaving the Cave, An Amiable Introduction to Anarchy, A Free Market Manifesto. Nice. Yeah, yeah, definitely going to put that in the uh, in the description below. Um, so if anybody wants to help out my show, please, um, you know, you can do so uh, through Patreon, through PayPal or Bitcoin. I love doing uh, I love doing these shows. I love doing these interviews. I want to do more of them. Please help me out. It really gives me a lot of encouragement. <laughs> Nothing like monetary help to encourage you to do more, right? <laughs> so, of course. So, James, thanks a lot for the conversation. I really enjoyed it. Dan- Danilo, I can't thank you enough for having me. Yes. So we'll definitely uh, do it again. Maybe when you write write a couple more articles, maybe do another presentation. We'll we'll talk again. That would be great. That would be great. So uh, so this is Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network and the Seeds of Liberty dot com and the Conscious Resistance dot com. Wishing everyone have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye. <laughs>